Hello and welcome to my Anatomy of a Character series. Today, as you can see from the title, we're taking a closer look at Alicent Hightower from House of the Dragon. I think she's one of the more interesting characters in the series, and her intricate situation often gets overlooked, especially when we consider that a big, life-altering decision was made for her rather than completely of her own volition, though that can be said for many House of the Dragon characters. But Alicent seduces the king and rises to the rank of queen consort not so much because of her personal ambition, but more so out of duty to her family. And it's fascinating to see where she is by the end of season 1, having been a pawn for most of her young life rather than a serious main player. As I typically do in this series, I'm only looking at the character as she is depicted on screen in the TV show, I don't make any comparisons to the book versions of Alice and Hightower in this video. So without further ado, let's dive in. When we are first introduced to Alicent as a teenager, we can see that she is a rather serious girl who soon becomes her father's spawn in the fight for power in Westeros. After King Viserys' wife Emma dies in childbirth, everyone is anxiously awaiting to see who the king will marry next, because the new queen will be the mother of his future children, and very likely the mother of a male heir. This position would give any woman and her family massive influence, which is why noble houses are offering their literal children for the king to wed. But becoming the king's wife is the path that Alicent's father chooses for her, not so much Alicent herself. And even though she plays along and plays her role really well in order to secure a good future for herself and help her family get ahead in life, I absolutely think that seeds of resentment are planted here. Her dissatisfaction over the unfolding of her life does come up in several scenes throughout the show. Usually it isn't in a fiery manner. She handles her emotions pretty well, at least in the start. But it's clear and quite logical that Alison's inner dissatisfaction makes her that much more resentful towards people who do have more freedom to explore their true wishes and desires, rather than be chained down to their gender, station and place in society. It's Alicent's father who pushes her into the Game of Thrones, and she does obey him, probably because that's how she was raised, but also because she does understand that one of the highest aspirations for a woman in her world is to marry well, get stability and security. And who better to marry then than a king? We can see a stark contrast when we look at Rhaenyra. For the young princess, it seems that life is more of a game pushing boundaries, getting away with a lot more than anyone who is not the king's child probably ever would. Alicent, however, is conditioned to keep secrets and she has to learn how to navigate the world and court life in a more tactful way than Rhaenyra ever had to. In many ways, Alicent has to grow up faster than Rhaenyra. This becomes all the more apparent because the show made the girls be basically the same age, but Alicent is already a wife, a mother, and a queen consort by the time that Rhaenyra is still enjoying her freedom as a princess. The differences in their responsibilities and duties, and whether they choose to commit to them or not, puts a strain on their relationship, which culminates in this episode, but we'll get to that later in the video. As a young queen consort after marrying Viserys, Alicent is slowly realizing what her role actually means. She is patient and navigates her life at court admirably, but we do see that she is lonely and that she is in a position far from glamorous. To put it bluntly, she is shackled down to the role of being a baby-making factory with practically no voice despite being the wife of a king. Yet she lives with Rhaenyra, who at first glance has so much freedom, although she too can't fully escape societal roles no matter what she does. But I think this creates the first bigger rift between Alicent and Rhaenyra, as we can witness in this scene. Alicent interrogates Rhaenyra about the rumors that Rhaenyra slept with her uncle Daemon, and Alicent is shocked that her friend would be so careless since she is the princess and heir to the throne. From Alicent's perspective, it is unimaginable that Rhaenyra could be so indulgent and blind to the consequences, and while this might be a personality difference between the two women, it might also be an indicator of what I mentioned previously, how Alicent had to grow up and take on responsibilities much more quickly than Rhaenyra. But I think this situation also makes Alicent realize something else. While she has been dutiful and done everything as was expected of her, whilst getting relatively little in return, Rhaenyra gets to shun her responsibilities with seemingly no consequences for her actions. On top of that, she lies to Alicent about her maidenhood, and I think this is another crack in the wall. Alicent defended her friend believing her, perhaps more so because she wanted to rather than because she was actually convinced by Rhaenyra's words, 
but she did nonetheless, and Rhaenyra betrayed that trust. Regarding this whole situation, perhaps Alicent did feel envious as well, not just because Rhaenyra gets to enjoy her life and sleep with whomever she likes, which Alicent cannot and never could, but it also rubs salt into her wounds because Alicent does her best to follow the rules, yet she seems to get the short end of the stick. Yes, she is queen consort and lives a very privileged life, but it seems to take more than it gives. The injustice that Alicent sees, the difference in how Rhaenyra is treated and how little she seems to value her privileged position, it all keeps piling on and brewing beneath the surface in Alicent's heart. At Rhaenyra's wedding to Laenor, we get Alicent's big moment, where she arrives wearing the now iconic green dress. As most of you will know if you've seen the show, when House Hightower calls its banners for war, they light a flame in Old Town that glows green. It's not necessarily a declaration of war per se, but it does seem that Alison is letting everyone know that from now on she will choose her own house and their interests over the house that she got married into. It's a hint of disloyalty to House Targaryen, because ever since Alison married the king, she's been wearing red, a Targaryen color. This is her reaction to Rhaenyra's lie, and she is communicating to everyone that her loyalties lie with her own house and their true allies. It's such a small moment, because it's just a dress, but at the same time I find it to be a very interesting way of a woman displaying power, in a sense, in a fictional world where men are in charge. Alicent can't afford to be like the men around her, who are outwardly critical and vocal when they disagree, but what she can do is utilize soft power to draw people to her cause. It's something that's very much in line with her character. If we look at Rhaenyra again, there are scenes in the show where she seems to resent not being born a man, because if she were, it would make her life easier, it would strengthen her claim to the throne and give her more personal freedom. This resentment often makes her double down and look for ways to rebel. Alicent, on the other hand, has always seemed to accept her role as a woman in a man's world, at least not resented as much as Rhaenyra. That doesn't mean she's always content, as I discussed before, but the difference is in Alicent and Rhaenyra's response to social constraints. When Alicent does stumble across obstacles, she doesn't double down or rebel outwardly. She instead works with what she has, opting rather for something closer to diplomacy and making allies, not trying to claim what she feels should be hers with fire and blood. When Alicent and Rhaenyra are older and have families and children of their own, King Viserys persistently rejects the insinuation that Rhaenyra's children are illegitimate. He will not talk about it, he will not hear about it, and he will have the tongue of anyone who dares speak it. Perhaps he's not just in denial because he wants to protect his daughter and her claim to the throne, but maybe also because admitting his own mistake in regards to handling the succession would further destabilize the realm that he struggled so desperately but so poorly to keep together. Let's see how this affects Alicent. For her, having Rhaenyra as the heir to the throne becomes unacceptable because Rhaenyra continues to do nothing to justify her title. Her children are so clearly not Laenor's that everyone can see it. Everyone is forced to pretend now that the king demands it, but can this last and what will the people say once they are free to speak their minds? Alicent cannot comprehend how Viserys keeps defending his daughter, despite the fact that she mocks the realm by not even valuing her position enough to at least have legitimate children who would one day succeed her. And then the situation grows from obvious but rather impersonal lies to very personal confrontations. Alicent's anger and resentment that have been simmering below the surface finally emerge. Alicent demands an eye for an eye because Rhaenyra's son Lucerys cut out the eye of her son Aemond, but she doesn't get the justice that she demands. King Viserys rejects her, admittedly cruel and unreasonable request, and that's when her cloak of righteousness slips off her shoulders. She grabs the knife and goes in to claim her justice, since no one else will help her achieve it. And from Alicent's perspective, it's really sad because she has essentially been told loud and clear, so long as Viserys is alive, Rhaenyra will be chosen over anyone else, regardless of the severity of her transgressions. It's a gut-wrenching realization if we look at it from Alicent's point of view. She can play by the rules, be the dutiful wife, go against her own desires to serve those around her and to survive in the world, 
yet Rhaenyra will continually be forgiven for any mistakes no matter how small or serious, because she's the king's firstborn daughter and Viserys will choose her. Rhaenyra's son physically harms Alicent's son, who is Viserys' child just as well, but Viserys will choose Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra has the audacity to try and make herself and her sons the victims in this situation, and Viserys will still choose her. All of this is too much for Alicent. This time it's about her children, it's about physical mutilation, and whether an eye for an eye is justice, it surely is from Alicent's perspective. Not because she wants to see Luke harmed, but because she wants Rhaenyra to experience consequences for once. She wants Viserys, and by extension justice, to choose her over Rhaenyra. But it never happens. All the years that Alicent has spent by the king's side, taking care of him, playing her role, giving him an heir and a spare, while Rhaenyra's mistakes were being covered up or ignored, and she apparently spent most of her time away on Dragonstone, all of Alicent's efforts seem to be for nothing, and her perceived justice once again eludes her. Viserys chooses Rhaenyra even on his deathbed. The moment Viserys is dead, Alicent tells her father about his passing, further confirming where her allegiances lie. She is well aware that her father is capable of securing their position at court now and ensuring that her son Aegon will be the one to sit on the throne, not Rhaenyra. Alicent has been conditioned from her days as young queen consort that it's either going to be her children or Rhaenyra that will sit on the throne, and that there is no way for one to survive if the other one reigns. At this point, this may well be true. It's impossible to imagine a scenario where one would not feel threatened by the other, and the possibility of a civil war, even if they did come to some sort of amicable agreement and decided who's going to reign and who will step down. Despite all of this, Alicent is still reluctant to kill Rhaenyra. It's impossible to completely disregard their past, but she feels like she has no choice. She is forced to protect herself and her family and put them first. She does everything she can before she has to unequivocally decide what to do about Rhaenyra. She makes sure that they conceal Viserys' death for as long as possible, to make alliances in advance, to make sure that Aegon is crowned. Far from this being the fault of her own, Alicent ends up in a situation where she must choose between her family or her former friend. Deciding between the two cannot be avoided, and even though she has effectively chosen a side years ago, Actually, pulling the trigger now is a different matter entirely. Alicent Hightower cannot be absolved of all responsibility when it comes to the events in House of the Dragon. She certainly put a few things in motion, whether directly or indirectly. But her situation is one of the more tragic ones, because she started as a chess piece, being moved around on the board, and once she took matters into her own hands, she realized that she only has a limited number of moves that she can make. She ends up in a war for survival, not because she ever truly sought power, but because the situation that King Viserys left the realm in could hardly have a different outcome than a dance of dragons. Thank you very much for watching. If you made it this far, let me know what you thought about Alicent's character and House of the Dragon. As always, I'll see you soon.